so we will try to get into uh, what continuous deployment and continuous delivery actually look like in practice. Um, it's hard to it's hard to give a talk about uh, continuous delivery at Etsy without really just talking about how we work in general. So I think that I think that a lot of the way that we work is is influenced and um, enabled by doing continuous delivery. So. I'll get right out of the way. Um, usually we refer to this as continuous deployment. So when you hear me say continuous deployment, really what we're talking about is the same thing. And you may not, um, I'm guessing that most people here probably don't know what Etsy is. Um, it, we are still not expanded very far into, into Europe or Asia. But Etsy is a marketplace. Um, it's, it's a place where uh, creative businesses can sell online, um, small independent shops. and. Um, we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with e-commerce. This is a this is a ba basically a seven-year-old company. Um, so we also look a lot like a startup. Despite the size of our team, we look like a lot like a startup, and we work that way. Um, and the primary product is a website. So just to be really clear about that, we're not packaging software. Outside of um, deploying an iOS app right now, uh, everything we ship really goes to web servers. Um, so that's just a little bit of context around that. Uh, this is what our growth looks like in terms of sales, just to give you a, a, a perspective on um, our continued uptick on this. This is gross sa sales in the marketplace. So this is the money transacted between buyers and sellers. Um, we're fairly large scale too. So we're doing um, nearly a billion and a half page views a month. Um, just in, in August, we did nearly, uh, or no, we did 76 million in transactions. Um, so. Sometimes when people talk about continuous deployment and uh, deploying quickly, there's an association with being a small company or, um, or being able to take greater risks. And I think the story here is that, is that we can take these risks and still enable um, a lot of growth and a lot of transactions to be happening. We have about 170 people committing to our code base. Um, that includes our engineers, um, designers, and product managers. And if you're, if you're committing code, you're also deploying code. This is the rate of deploys that we've seen over the last two years. Uh, we started basically doing continuous deployment at the, at the very, very tail end of 2009. Uh, and as you can see, it sort of starts ticking up there. The difference between the colors here is that yellow is a full application deploy where we're pushing all the code that's on, um, in our main line. The red is where we're flipping uh, config flags, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but you can see that these are um, these metrics are per day. So you can see that on average, we're you know generally we're doing between 20 and 30 deploys a day, and then our config changes are somewhere you know generally 10 to 10 to 20, sometimes 30 or 40 config changes in a day. So that's how fast we're changing things on the site. Uh, we're going to try to talk about um, some of the more advanced topics, and I'm expecting that you come to. Uh, come into here sort of knowing some of the background of what continuous delivery is. I'm not really going to go into um, so much of the what, but really more of the how it looks at, at Etsy. Um, this is the wiki, part of the Wikipedia article, and these are some of the terms that you probably recognize. Repeatedly push, low risk, minimal manual overhead. Um, what's missing from that, I think, are some things like this. And, and these are some of the topics that we'll end up talking about a little bit more. Um, DevOps, who knows of DevOps? People know this movement? Great, awesome. Um, working directly on mainline, trunk, or master, whatever you want to call it. Um, feature flags, people know what feature flags are? Great, looking good. And then, uh, and branching in code, which is obviously you've got mainline, you've got feature flags, and branching in code. Those are really, um, really sort of the heart of what we're doing. I'll start with an apology, though, um, because I heard a little bit of, of chuckling at the end of the last talk when PHP was mentioned. We work in PHP. Um, so please don't run out the doors. Um, so this is really the crux of the talk. Uh, what continuous deployment looks like at Etsy in practice every single day. Um, this is less of what it is, more of how we apply it. And because I'm not a consultant and I'm not a very good salesperson, it's going to be more of this is just what we're doing and this is what we find that works, and less of you guys should go out and try to do it just this way because I think it's a great idea for you. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, proposition, so I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that, that you're doing things wrong if you don't want to do this, but this is what's working for us. This is our deploy button. Um, everybody on our, on our engineering team, all of our designers, all of our product managers who are committing code have access to this. 
Um, as long as you can get through the LDAP uh, credentials, you can get to this. Uh, when you press this button, we deploy all of our app code to our production servers. Um, that process only takes about two minutes for, for the actual deployment. Um, there's some build and, and things that li uh, lead up to that, but, but pushing the code is pretty, pretty fast. So some then and now. Um, then is the sort of uh, before the end of 2009 when we, when we transferred over to uh, continuous deployment, and now is the 2010 since. Um, then is hours and hours of deploys, and as Michael talked about, um, the deployment army. This was usually at least five people, and when I was interviewing for Etsy, um, one of the people who was interviewing me had to leave during the interview to go to go help with the deploy because it had been running too long um, and things were failing. It was highly orchestrated and infrequent. Now, it's one person pushing a button, the entire build and deploy takes about 15 minutes, and it's a rapid, rapid cycle. Previously, this was a special event that we had to plan out and organize. Now it's commonplace, and if you ask most of the managers on the team, they don't even know what's being deployed in a single day. Um, frankly, that's a little bit of a challenge for us, but it's one of the things where we've pushed decision making and, and, and speed of delivery out to, out to our smaller team. So every engineering team is about you know, two to six people out of, the, out of that entire group. Each of them is sort of, the point is to empower all these teams to, to go out and build their features rapidly. In the past, I, I talk a lot about um, managing our site in an operational sense, and this is one of the things that the continuous deployment allows us to do. Uh, in the past, if we had a problem with a deploy, we'd be blocked through the, the re remainder of that deploy and then through the follow-up deploy to push a fix. That's going to be hours and hours and hours. And now, um, with continuous deployment, we're able to make changes very quickly. Um, a, a poor deploy can be uh, resolved within about 10 to 15 minutes. And if we just are going to be tweaking config flag, those deploys actually only, only take about five minutes. There was a lot more complexity around deployments in the past. Uh, we had packaging, we had release branches. Um, we coupled schema changes together with code deploys, which as you imagine, if you're trying to do that and you're transforming data at the same time, um, you're probably going to have downtime for that as you're, as you're moving both those versions ahead. Now we work off mainline. We do very minimal linking. There's always some things that we have to put together uh, in place before, um, before we push. But our builds are, 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 I'm sorry, our deploys are essentially our syncs. And again, this is, this is PHP we're working with. So this is one of the huge advantages we get out of that, which is that we can just R sync files into place and they start running. We don't have to worry about any other um, restarts or things like that. So to sum that up, old or, or the past, this is slow and complex and special. New, or, or what we're doing now, is fast and simple and it's common. It's so common that when you start at Etsy, this is the first thing you do. You learn how to deploy the site. On your first day, we assign you a project to put your you know, picture of yourself onto our, onto our company like team page. And that doesn't really involve a whole lot of code. It doesn't, it doesn't involve like really learning um, the deep innards. It's, it's a pretty simple project for figuring out where to put a picture of yourself, getting it into a template. Um, but then, you know, that comes with the overhead of understanding um, how to get onto your virtual machine, uh, where the code lives, how to run tests, how to deploy the site, and where to find metrics to, to ensure that everything is running properly uh, after the deploy is done. So on the very first day, we're looking at making, um, taking all the ceremony away from deployments. On the second day, we let you complete your tax forms and insurance and benefits and things like that. Um, that's the harder stuff. I didn't mention anything in the first two days about, about learning about our framework or our code base. We use an ORM. Um, coding patterns or any of that stuff. That's stuff you can learn over time. But if you push off learning about deployment until further down the road after you spend a couple of months building something, then it becomes a big scary event. And that's exactly what we're trying to avoid doing. Because this is the button that's going to be in front of you when you have to deploy. And that means something. Um, we're really, really good at doing this. Like I said, we're, we're pushing uh, 20 to 30 times a day. And if you're not familiar with that, that should sound really scary, and you should have like kind of a pit in your stomach. Um, handing somebody a deploy button without any safety measures is like handing somebody a gun without a safety. So I want to talk a little bit about how to make that safe, but I'm going to tell you about that later. I just want to point out that if that were 
inherently unsafe, and if we were failing deploys every single time we did it, or even 10% of the time we did it, then I don't think, I'm speculating, but I don't think we would see the growth over the last two years that we see like this. So continuous deployment for us looks like this. Small, frequent changes. Keeping, as Michael was talking about in the last talk, um, keeping the batches of changes that you're making really small. Um, constantly integrating into production, and I'm going to talk a lot about that, uh, and doing this repeatedly throughout the day. So questions, you know, some of the things I want to answer in this talk are some of the questions that regularly come up when we talk about, you know, the process of deploying and, and the tools that we use for deploying, which I'm not going to talk about so much this time, but, um, but how that impacts what we're doing. So how do we build so many features so quickly? And the answer is we're not building features that we're releasing every single day. We're making small incremental changes to the site. We're making additions to the site. And if you think about it in terms of commits that you're making to a repo, it's the same thing. You're making a small amount of, of, of code change that works, that you know is, is valid, and then you're, um, then you're integrating it with production. So software deploys don't equal product launches. We can launch code late, we can actually launch features later, and we can organize that into, into a, a bigger thing. Um, but deploys happen really frequently. Um, so these commits you know, typically only represent a day or maybe a couple of days of work, uh, and rarely they, do they make up in themselves a complete feature or a complete, um, a complete project. So we push code um, into, you know, that is gated by config flags. So we can push changes that are incomplete because we've got sections of our application that are turned off. Um, we, we refer to this as dark releases. Um, and so let's look at exactly what that looks like. For us, um, we, do, we, we tend to try to do the simplest thing possible in, in a lot of cases. Uh, our config flags are just built into an array in PHP. And the reason for that is that um, if PHP and Apache are working on a server, then we know that we've got access to our configs. If we put them into a decentralized service somewhere else or a distributed service, then we have to ensure that that service is available. And um, we've learned the hard way that that's not always the case. So if we're building out a new search feature, if we're, if we're refactoring search in place, um, then we start with a config flag um, in the off position. And then we look at the code that exists, and we've got you know, some, some kind of thing that we were doing in the past that we want to improve upon. And we just wrap that. So we've got our config flag says, if the new search is on, then we'll do this new thing that we want to do using Solar. And if it's not, we'll, we'll just use the default old version. Um, our checks are actually a little bit more sophisticated than this because we can, we, can set, um, we can set values other than just on and off. It's not binaries, um, but we have different levels of, of ramping up. So on really means 100%. Off means 0% for public users. Um, but we can also ramp up to any percentage of users, and we can do special things like only staff users or maybe a list of people like myself and John and Kellen are the people who can see this particular feature. So we are deploying code frequently, and we're validating in production, but we're doing this in a way that's hidden from the public. So software deploys, again, don't mean launches, and they don't mean public visibility into what you're changing. I've sort of already talked about this, but I'll, I'll just point it out again. Um, these are small changes. Typically, we're adding portions of a new feature, so new classes and controllers and methods in there. Um, we might have designers who are working on graphics and style sheets and templates that are getting added in. And um, we might have people who are working on copying content changes. We don't really work with a CMS on the site because um, deploying, deploying a change that's in the repo is essentially our content management system. And then we also have the ability to turn flags on and off and, and ramp up. But this enables us to also respond to issues on the site as well as, as build new features. So, so imagine our security team gets a report of a, of a hole on the site and we want to be able to respond quickly. Having the main line um, ready for deployment and being able to deploy quickly means that we can have somebody put in a patch um, in a very quick manner and deploy that quickly because we have the confidence that we know how to do this and we don't have to do a lot of, of pre-planning or organization around releasing our code or releasing the site. 
We can also respond to unexpected loads in traffic or, or contention on, on back-end services. Uh, load shedding is a thing that we do often, which means that we turn off some feature um, because the back end is getting thrashed or, or something is happening in production that we never anticipated before. So I liken this to uh, an airline and its pilot. Uh, if you were building a version, a single, singular version of software that you, that you deploy on a regular basis, um, then you only have the option to run that one way. This is kind of like having a pre-programmed route from, from London to New York. And once you're in the air, you can't do anything about that. You can't, you can't move around um, turbulence and such. But what we look at um, continuous deployment enabling for us is that we have, um, as we'll talk a little bit later, and, and Michael talked about a little bit earlier, we collect tons and tons of metrics, which are like these dials that are in front of us. And we put those metrics in front of everybody so you can see them. And then we have this really rich um, set of config flags. So we can tweak little, little things. We can take sp specific servers out of rotation. Um, we can turn up the traffic on a particular feature. We can turn off features that are not working. Um, and this operator becomes, uh, there's a great question of, is that operator somebody on our operations staff? Or is that an engineer? And does it really matter? We sort of blur those lines. It's not, we don't hand off software for our operations team to, to run on their own, but we're involved with that. And what this looks like in practice is um, these red boxes are, are pointing out different parts of, of a tool on the site called favorites, which is, is like your ability to bookmark specific products to come back to later. Um, and with a simple config flag, we can just flip that off. Um, and as you see, in our, our interfaces will just hide, hide those um, pieces of the application. So if, if our favorites tool, which we've seen in the past, had too much, uh, too much load um, and was, was failing requests for some reason, we can just turn it off. And most users are not even going to know that. The next big question we get is, how do you continuous de continuously deploy database config, uh, schema changes? And this is, um, I know that this came up a couple of times earlier today. Um, the answer is we don't. Our code deploys happen about once every 15 to 20 minutes during the day. We do schema changes on Thursday. And the reason for this is that the schema, obviously, um, those changes are more expensive. Some changes can take hours. Uh, some we've seen take days. Um, so we don't have as fine-grained control over when that starts and stops. So it's hard to know if you were to change a version of code in, resp in response to the schema um, when that's supposed to land in production. So the risk around schema changes are higher. Um, those are places where we force more conversations about are we doing the right thing um, and move somewhat out of individual teams and talk more broadly about, about the risk involved. So our application is actually largely monolithic. Um, within it, you could probably find things that look like services. Um, models around database, different parts of our database schema um, typically get treated as services where our controllers are talking to that. There's much, many, much fewer external web services in our application. Uh, and I think that that's somewhat different than what Sam was talking about this morning. But this is what we found seems to work really well. Um, we've got a lot of people working out of a shared code base, so we have uh, very high visibility into what's changing and very high visibility into where um, different parts of our application are coupled together, wh where that does happen. Um, it also means that when we run through tests, we're testing sort of end to end and everything in between. Um, one of the things we've punted on for a long time is trying to figure out exactly what tests are associated with a particular change. Um, instead, we've just managed to keep our tests really fast. On the front end, uh, when we do a deploy, we're deploying all these different services together. And we didn't always do this. But, um, but we have shared libraries that, that power um, the Etsy.com website, uh, the developer API, back office and support tools that we've got, things like that. Um, and what we found in the past is if we deploy these services separately, then we end up with latent bugs in, in underlying code. So if we have a library that, that both Etsy.com and the developer API rely on, and we only de deploy the API, then once we're into production, we can find that the API is working perfectly. Um, but we end up with bundled, you know, the sort of bundled commit that we've never deployed to Etsy.com, 
um, batching along with some future commit and making that commit or in that deploy more confusing if, if something goes wrong. So we can see we, we've found in the past bugs that occur in lower level libraries. Um, and if we don't expose, if we don't integrate all of those front ends into production at the same time, we lose track of some of those bugs. And that's, that's been a problem for us. That's one of those practical things that we've learned over time. So we're shooting for fewer surprises. Um, external services are not deployed with the main application. And uh, I talked about that being somewhat separate, separate uh, schedules. External services for us look like our database, our database schema. Um, our search cluster, which runs in Solar and Java, so it's a very different animal from, from PHP. And photo storage, which has also got a completely different uh, backend infrastructure than our main web application. And we deal with this by, um, by configs, config flags that allow, allow us to move backward and forward on different states of, of those services. So a, um, a config flag that allows us to use a new versus an old version of a schema or a new versus an old endpoint of our, of our search tier. Uh, changing the flags themselves is very, very fast. Like I said, this is less than five minutes. Um, it doesn't include, you know, changing, excuse me, changing that config flag doesn't mean that we're merging any code and we're not, um, not having to deal with reverting pieces of code if something goes wrong. It's literally one line changing from things like off to 1% or off to on. So we deal with this by exposing multiple versions of a service or a schema. And our application expects multiple versions um, and has config flags to allow us to go backwards and forwards. And so we'll talk about that in, in, the, in respect to a, um, changing a database schema and how that looks. Generally, we prefer ads over alters. We don't like altering data in place, um, especially if we're relying on, on some kind of data transform to happen on a column. Like if, you're, if your address column, for some reason, the formatting of it had to change, um, and your application is expecting one, one side versus the other. Um, this is something that I believe Sam referred to as non-breaking expansions. I've actually never heard that term before this morning. Um, but that pretty well describes um, what we're talking about here. We're talking about adding on new columns instead of altering the things in place. Alters can take a lot of time, like I talked about before. Um, transforming data, especially on, on a, on a, on a uh, column in production, um, can make your code incompatible. And trying to link that up with a code deploy is really, really difficult. Um, reverting something that you've transformed to a new version is also very difficult. So, so exposing two different versions in production is really important for us, so we can move back and forward. So I'll talk about the practical aspect of how we did this um, for a particular project we did earlier this year, which was merging two different tables. Um, a couple years ago, we thought that having a separate user preferences table was a great denormalization. Uh, we found that we didn't use it that much, and it would just be better to have the few values that were, that were stored in that uh, table to be merged in with our users table. Um, this wasn't just something we were looking around to make work for ourselves. It turned out that we were also moving the data store. Uh, itself, so it seemed like a good opportunity to glob those two things together. The steps look like this. You start by writing to both versions of the schema, um, and then once you've started writing to both, you need to figure out how to backfill all the existing data that you've had in the past. And then once you have that and you've validated, you start reading from the new version. And once you're good with that, you cut off the old version. And I'll go, in, uh, go into more detail about this. And obviously, you start really with, with adding the new version to the schema before you do anything else. And that looks like this. You add the schema, and we, add, we added some new columns to the users table. And we also started with three different, three different config flags that we had never had before. The first was the existing state of the system, and we turned that to on. So writing our, writing our users' preferences to this old table that we were using in, in the past. And then two others that represented the state that we were moving to, where we were writing preferences to the users' table, and then where we're reading preferences from the users' table, as opposed to reading them from the user preferences table. So in the second step, we write the code for writing to two places. And after we've got that deployed to production, then we flip the flag. So our actual, our actual um, release of this means that we're just flipping a flag. It's, we're not actually releasing application code. These are two different deploys happening. 
And then we go through a process um, that happens offline where we where we'll write some scripts to transform data or, or just copy data from one place to another um, to catch us up to where we were when we did that release. Because we're still not reading from the from the new version, we're reading from the old version. And then we get when we want to go to the new version, uh, like I said, we've got this very fine grained ability to tune up traffic onto a version of, of, of our application. So uh, we start reading preferences from the users table only for people in, within the company. And we can do that for as long as we want. Sometimes that's a couple of hours to validate something small, and sometimes it's a couple of weeks. Then we can go to 1%, and we can go to 5%, and whatever else we want. And as we ramp up, we look at, we look at feedback. We look at um, logs from our application servers in the database to make sure that there's nothing surprising showing up in there. And we look at metrics to make sure that we're seeing what we would expect, the, the right amount of uptake. Um, on a new feature, and then we'll also refer back to whether we're getting support tickets for people complaining about this particular feature. Uh, and we'll look in our user forms to see if anybody's reporting that there's a bug on the site related to this. And when we feel good about that, then we move on to the point of, of reading um, at 100% onto the, onto the new version, uh, which means that we're basically ready to cut off rights to the old version. And we can do that. We don't have to actually delete any code at that point. We can just turn it off, and everything's in place. So, you know, we try to avoid um, many l releases that have anything to do with making changes to logic in production, with the exception of just these flags. This is something I learned uh, two nights ago, is in, I guess, more of a sort of pattern or enterprise -y way referred to as branch by abstraction. And I think it's, I think it's a great setup. This is this you know completely models what we do. I've added my own names in here. We've got our controllers talking to a user's model, and within the model is where we put this config flag. So all the people writing code that goes out to the front end have no don't really have to know where to get their user preferences. They don't need to touch um, SQL or changes to to queries, things like that. Um, the user's model is the only place that needs to know that these two different things exist. Uh, and that's where the changes happen. There's a couple of links down here. These slides will be available later, but these, there's some links to um, more, uh, more discussion of that. But like I said, I didn't know that name, so I've been calling this for a long time. I call this the migration four step. And um, I guess in, in truth, there's probably a fifth step to that, which is uh, going back and cleaning up the code after you're done. And that always becomes a question for us because um, it's a question of whether you'll ever need that code again. If you stop writing your data to that, to that old version, um, then you probably don't need the code. If the code is a complete mess, you're probably going to want to get rid of it. And if it's a performance problem, you're certainly going to want to get rid of it. But if the old system, if the old version is still uh, valid and it's still stable, then it's a good exit strategy for if something goes wrong with your new version. So ha keeping that in place to be able to roll back in the future, maybe, maybe days or weeks or even months. Um, and also, this is a matter of if you have time, because cleanup takes time. There's a trade-off there. So when Michael and I started talking about this talk, um, we, we got on this question about how does continuous delivery impact uh, processes that are upstream of production and engineering? And I thought about this a lot. Um, this, isn't, this isn't really tightly involved with continuous delivery as it is just what we've been enabled to do and how we like to work. Um, our upstream process is really, really lightweight. We do, we do fairly little planning um, in terms of writing things down. Uh, we have high code visibility. Our teams aren't siloed. They're working in the same place. Um, there's no territorialism over this is my, my code, this don't touch it. Um, and there's high communication. So that's something that's really helped us um, without having you know, sort of design by contract um, situations. Everyone can deploy code, and deploying is commonplace. This isn't, this isn't a special event. So keeping deployment really cheap um, allows us to do things more rapidly, which is what we like. So there's some philosophies I want to talk about, some of the things that we really, um, that we find really successful for us within continu a continuous deployment environment. Gathering data should also be cheap. So the ability to get a, a, a prototype into production and put it in front of a limited beta group or 1% or of your users and gather data on whether it's working is incredibly helpful. Um, 
we're looking with new features for interest in engage and engagement before we spend a lot of time making sure that that is a, um, a really, really solid architecture. So oftentimes the first, um, the first iteration is much of, very much an experiment, and it largely doesn't matter what the architecture looks like when you're deploying it to 1%. We're almost never certain what's going to happen if we make a change to the site in terms of whether it'll be a better feature or whether it'll be a worse, worse feature. In some cases, this is uh, changing the size of the button that says Add to Cart. Um, but we like to be able to test and gather data around that. And we don't like wasting time getting to that. We focus on getting code to production as quickly as possible. And so we hire f uh, designers, graphic designers, who are actually really functional in a code base. Um, they're able to, our designers are able to write in, in HTML and CSS. Um, they commit directly to our Git repo. Even crazier is they use the command line to do this. Um, and they can also stub a controller out just largely enough that they can um, create the templates that we're going to use on the site um, so that an engin engineer can follow through with additional logic. But they can basically stub out what something is going to look like and deploy that to production so we can look at it ourselves. Um, like I said, um, architecture largely doesn't matter when we're talking about very small groups, and we want to find out if something's going to be worthwhile. When we start, we'll design um, within a small group within your team, your peers. Um, we'll take as many shortcuts as possible, and we'll, we'll reach out to an architect on the team, somebody more senior, um, basically as a sanity check to make sure that we're not cutting ourselves off from doing the smart thing later on. Uh, but we often just stick to known patterns. If we, if we, uh, we don't want to invent new crap to add to the site if the stuff that we have on the site already is, is still holding up. We only want to invent new, new things when, uh, when we know that it's not working anymore for us. Another thing that we feel is really important, because deploying is really easily, easy and, and it doesn't take a lot of um, organization to, to release something, is that we try to kill things off as, as quickly as possible and as early as possible. We like to get rid of code that's not working, get rid of features that aren't working. Um, supporting legacy features in particular is, a, is really boring and frustrating. Um, and it, it takes away time from your engineering team. So it, it's really great to get rid of that. And it also, doing that frees you up from thinking about um, your code being perfect all the time. If you know that somebody's going to take joy in getting rid of it in the future after your, your experiments failed, um, you'll focus rather. You'll focus on shipping your features more quickly rather than building cathedrals. So we always like to ask: Is the dumb solution enough for us to build a product? And how long is the dumb solution going to last? Because oftentimes, by the time you scale ten percent, most of the assumptions you started with are wrong, and you start rearchitecting. And rearchitecting is the thing that we like to to focus on. After we've seen that something is working, then we, pr then we prove it out further and make it better. Um, this, the architecture that we had when we were 10 million pages a month is totally different than what it was when we were 100 million page views a month. And it is now completely different as we're over a billion pages a month. So we try not to take ourselves too seriously. Um, there's a corollary, I think, to this, which is um, don't hastily judge the people who built the version before you, because their assumptions were completely different. This is a quote, um, as I was talking to Kellen, who's our CTO, about this talk and getting and trading some ideas, um, I decided to just quote him directly on this and not completely steal it, because I thought it was really put, well put. Uh, we, optimize for being, we don't optimize for being right or having the right architecture. Uh, we optimize for knowing when we're wrong and when it's time to change. And so we, we work really hard at becoming good at changing our architecture. Um, that migration four step that I talked about, we are freaking masters at doing that work. That's pretty much what my teams do almost all the time, is going back and refactoring things that aren't working, or moving from an old data store to a new data store, um, and finding out how to make things better. So we're constantly working through this process of cutting out the old and bringing in the new um, with complete uptime. Where we do spend time is, is within the second or third iteration. When we know and we've got data uh, that suggests that this is a worthwhile endeavor, then we start bringing in more senior engineers to review um, how the architecture works, how people are using it, um, and what our new expectations are from it after we've gathered data. We're no longer guessing at this point, so it's worth investing time. 
So another, another section I want to talk about, um, I've got about 15 minutes left, I think, here. So I want to get into a bit about integration and operations. Um, and then I think that there's a little bit more about a few final thoughts that if I can get to, it'll be great. If not, no big deal. So this is sort of my definition of how we do continuous deployment. Um, and, and the main piece here is that we're constantly integrating into production. Um, the part, the safety measures I talked about, um, these should be pretty obviously, pretty obvious to everybody here. Code review before you commit. We like to get peers um, looking at code and just making sure that we're not really doing the dumb things. And also, because we're changing things so rapidly in, in production, it's always good having somebody knowing, somebody sitting next to you or somebody you know, in another group, knowing what you're about to deploy, because so many different people are deploying things throughout the day. Automated tests before you deploy. Um, this should also be obvious. We want to do as much validation as we can in development um, before we push changes into production, which begs the question, why do we bother integrating with production? If we're writing and committing tests with our code, then we, there's a, an assumption that maybe running them uh, against every commit is enough to ensure all of our assumptions. Um, why are we bothering with deploying the code as well? It feels like maybe we're asking for additional trouble. And the answer to that is that dev, your dev environment is not the same as production. Um, and if you think that it is, you're going to constantly be surprised the way that we're constantly surprised. Um, if your dev environment were exactly like prod, then the unit tests running in dev would be perfect at validating that your software works. But when you deploy it to production, you often find that that's not true. So quick question for everybody. Um, how many of you write tests while you're writing your code or even before you're writing your code? I would expect a lot of hands in this group. How many of you wait until you've written all of your code before you write the tests? OK, amazing. I see no hands, which means that you guys are all model engineers and you should pat yourselves on the backs. This is fantastic. We. Um, Integrating with production is a test in itself, which is why we do this frequently and in small batches. This is the same thing with unit tests, we frequently and in small batches. Um, I heard this recently. Production is truly the only place you can validate your code. Recently means 40 minutes ago. Michael said that in the last talk. Production and dev are not the same because these are the types of things that, that go wrong. Um, these are the things that we sometimes don't expect. Some of the things that I really like on this list, um, somewhat further down, legacy data. We have seven years of users who have been in multiple versions of our software, and, and the data about them has changed to the point that now people are in states that didn't exist two years ago when we hired most of our engineering team. So they don't even know how the data is supposed to look. And we don't have all of this data in depth because it's, there's too much of it. Um, we also don't have production traffic running in our dev environment, so it's hard to simulate um, all the different scenarios that can go wrong in production. Yes, you can model traffic and you can do simulations, but models and simulations only show um, what you expect or what, or what you've seen in the past. You may be replay, replaying history, but that's what's, what's happened in the past. That changes, basically, the future changes every time we deploy code. What, what our application looks like changes every time somebody makes a commit. So it's really hard to know everything that could go wrong. Um, here's one of my favorites, and I, I, I'm so embarrassed to even know that I was involved in this. Using a MySQL database to test an application that's eventually going to be on Oracle. This is probably the worst you can possibly think of. Priceless. Um, verify frequently in small batches. Um, not after we've written weeks and months of code, but all the time are we integrating with production. And just so you don't lose track of this, dev is not equal to, to prod. Um, we work as a team, we work really, really hard to keep these two environments as close as possible. Um, do people know about Chef or Puppet or configuration management? OK, so we play, um, we play the same recipes as prod in development. We keep these in sync. Um, yet, based on all those things I told you before, we can't keep it the same. And the larger we get, the more dev is not like production. So we like to also keep deployments really simple and really quick. We like to focus on things that bring us value. 
uh, when I started, we had four different environments. We had dev, where people are working, and then QA, where people are integrating. Staging, which is very much like a pre-production, um, and then production. But we realized we should probably trim some fat. These lines are where, where those environments are actually sort of split in terms of services. Dev and QA shared the same database, so they had the same, same terrible data. Um, staging also had its own database and its own memcache servers. It's totally separate from production. Um, so not seeing traffic and, and not seeing the same things that you see in production. Uh, that was fairly unuseful for us. Um, yet we spent time testing and staging and, and uncovering things that were surprising, uh, which always ended up being a, an artifact of the, of the environments being wrong and, and unsimilar. So we've actually cut it down to something like this. Dev has its own databases and services, and then a pre-prod, which, which we've renamed from staging so there's not confusion. Pre-prod talks to the same servers, um, the services as our production servers talk to. Um, so pre-prod is essentially our sanity checking spot. We, we dump new code onto it and make sure that it's still working, that say like the schemas or, or the new versions of a, of a service um, that we're depending on are in production and that they're working. So it's really important to, to think about um, trimming fat from your deploy pipeline, making it fast. Test and integrate where you'll see value. Like I said, QA didn't provide a lot of value for us. We have a build stage where we run all of our, uh, our integration and unit tests, um, but we no longer have a web interface for that to be able to manually click around. It didn't provide us any value. Config flags um, protect us because, again, we're integrating with production, but we're not just throwing things out in front of users all the time. Um, we're preve uh, preventing risk by doing this, and we have this very rich mechanism for being able to turn the visibility of, of a product up in production. And this, I think, is probably what our canary pools look like, is our ability to turn up um, a new part of our application on just a subset of our users and be able to inspect them versus other parts of our user base. I talked about um, validating before deploying. We also validate after. There's no reason you can't run the same tests in production. So we do that. We also have um, automated alerts that, that go off when these fail. We use real-time metrics and dashboards that look at everything from the health of our network and servers to how our application is running, how many, how many people have hit a particular part of the application or triggered a particular event, and then things like business uh, metrics, like are our checkouts happening and how much money have we made throughout the day? And we put these metrics in front of everybody. Um, we actually have a dashboard that as you're deploying code, this is one of the things you put in front of you, is, is to be able to look at the health of the system. And I apologize that, that all of these are so gray and hard to read, but I'll try to tell you the lower, the lower side is our web tier. That's all of our um, Apache servers and the number of requests per second. Um, up top are things like logins and registrations and checkouts and... Um, and then there's some page performance in, in the middle, so like if, if our performance suffers after a deploy. And as Michael pointed out in the last talk, we use these vertical lines to signify when we've changed something in the application or a config. So generally, um, well, I'll get to that. The, you know, the, the question will be, um, why as an engineer do I need this in front of me? And the, the answer is, oh yeah, because we don't have any release managers doing this for you. You're doing it yourself. You're pushing the button yourself, and you're also monitoring when code goes into production to make sure things are working. Um, so yes, these deploy lines basically signify changes, and we're looking for um, those metrics to shift. Sometimes they'll go up, sometimes they'll go down. Um, sometimes they'll look like this. This is one of my favorites to watch after a deploy, which is your, our egress bandwidth. And if our, our bandwidth from our data center drops by 25%, you might be thinking um, that might not have been expected. Um, that looks like sort of interesting behavior. We don't know whether that's something that just broke, whether people aren't getting to a certain part of our site, or maybe that we've just improved something, where we're shipping a lot fewer images, um, or images are scaled down dramatically. So we have this operational feedback cycle that every engineer is involved in. You write code, you release code, and then you, you monitor what's going on in production and whether it's, whether it's working um, the way you expect. And there's this, great, um, there's this great thing, I think, from military use, observe, orient, decide, and act. So we observe and orient. We're collecting metrics, and we're looking at those metrics 
gauging whether something's working properly or, or not working properly. And then we're making a decision and making changes to our application on a frequent basis to respond to that. Continuous deployment allows us to keep that cycle really, really close and tight. And I tend to talk about this, I refer to this as a uh, theoretical versus practical software engineering. Um, if you're not, in my opinion, if you're not working and seeing what production looks like, then you are largely making guesses at how your software works. Uh, but if you're operating your software and in being involved in looking at metrics, then you are actually um, practically involved in how it works and understanding the ramifications of decisions you've made. Such as um, the kinds of surprises that you might find if we turn off the tools that allow you to translate on the site. Um, we found this out at one point when we were doing some tests, which was that our page performance got dramatically better when we shut off those tools. It led us to looking more closely at, um, at how the internationalization tools work for us and refactoring them. Um, it also puts you really close to when things go wrong. It's really nice when you, um, when you push some code and find out that you're, you were completely wrong or you deployed a bug. Um, that, that burn sticks with you. Um, and yes, it's really broken. So again, this, it's this. It's, it's not just building the plane, but flying it. It's all the dials and levers close at hand. Um, we do this constantly, and although these dates mean probably nothing to you in the United States, these are the sort of milestones that lead up to our, our Christmas shopping season. And this is the point where e-commerce sites usually stop deploying code. And that looks like this for us. These red bands are, are the month before Christmas. And we are still at the point where we're able to react and operate the system. And I'm going to cut it off there. There's the last bit I'm going to run out of time for. Um, but that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. Right, the question is, uh, in what, in what, um, at what point do we involve business? And um, the answer to that is, is these engineering teams I was talking that, about that are very small. They're typically made up of about two to, two to five, maybe two to six engineers and then a designer, maybe, and then a product manager who is essentially representing the business. So we will have, in terms of planning, we'll have generally about three month spans that we'll plan out. We'll do some quarter, like very um, um, thick brush strokes of what quarterly planning looks like. And then each of those teams will, will be like sort of running off on their own. It's very decentralized, whether they're getting what they want. Yeah, so part of the metrics collection is also um, a large amount of uh, business intelligence that we collect. So within that team, um, we're able to, if we're, if we're deploying a test or deploying a new feature, um, we get a very rich amount of data that comes back from the site that, we, that informs the business of what goes next and whether things are working as we had expected. Thank you very much.